By far the most space is given to one above the other. This one with the most space is full of promises of restoration and ascendancy to the nation of Israel through the work of the Messiah. Now the other stream is that which describes redemption through suffering and death brought about by the same Messiah. Now I said earlier that these appear to be two streams because really it is only an appearance. We who live after the revelation of the New Testament understand this better than, for instance, Jesus' disciples did. Especially before the coming of the Holy Spirit. Surely, with his death and resurrection, Jesus fulfilled the expectations of the suffering servant. That is to say that this stream of prophecy, which tells of the redemption of mankind from their sin, is fulfilled very clearly in Jesus Christ. He is our propitiation. He is the one who came and stood between us and the wrath of God and provided in himself a sufficient and super-sufficient sacrifice so that we could be forgiven for our sins and invited into the family of God, become adopted into his family. In a way, 1 Corinthians 15, 24 through 28 is a distillation of all of those Old Testament texts which deal with that other stream of prophecy which Jesus has yet to fulfill and which upon his fulfilling will return things to the way that they were meant to be when God first created the world. So, having said all of that, let's read our passage this morning. It's 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 24 through 28. Here Paul says, Then comes the end, when he, that is Jesus Christ, delivers the kingdom to God the Father, after destroying every rule and every authority and power. For he must reign until he has put all enemies under his feet. The last enemy to be destroyed is death. For God has put all things in subjection under his feet. But when it says all things are put in subjection, it is plain that he is accepted who put all things in subjection under him. When all things are subjected to him, then the Son himself will also be subjected to him who put all things in subjection under him, that God may be all in all. Let's pray and ask the Lord to bless our time here. Thank you, Father, for this passage. I pray that you'd help me to be able to communicate the excellence that is in it in a way that glorifies you. I pray you'd help my voice to last to the end. And I pray that you'd help all of us to appreciate how it is that you have got a will that does come about. And I pray that we would understand our place in it. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. This message is more or less about the future, but the future and the way that you look at it, the way that I look at it, ought to have a huge impact in the way that we live now. You see, we are called to live as subjects to God's kingdom now, even though we have not fully realized the excellencies of his will that will be revealed in that time. Jesus, when he was teaching his disciples to pray, said one of the things that they ought to pray is, Thy, will be thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And yet we live in a world that is largely more and more hopeless, darker and darker, because it is dominated by man's dominion. This passage talks about how all of that is going to be brought to nothing through the work of the serpent crusher, through the part of the work that he has not yet done, which is prophesied and which will and must come to pass. Paul describes two main stages to what is going to be happening in the ultimate fulfillment of God's promises. First, there must be destruction. Certain things need to come to an end. Any reading of ap apocalyptic literature will assure you that this is indeed going to be the case. The second phase will be subjection. After the destruction or through the destruction, um, there will be a, a, a returning of creation to the way that it was meant to be. 
Now this destruction that we see is going to happen, um, we see detailed there in the passage. Then comes the end, when this kingdom will be delivered to God the Father after destroying every rule, every authority, and every power. Now this is a very specialized set of words that Paul uses in multiple places, and I want to just look at them so that we can understand what is being talked about. So um, Ephesians chapter 1. Verses 15 through 23 contain the first um, example. Ephesians chapter 1, Paul is saying to the church at Ephesus, For this reason, because I have heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love toward all the saints, I do not cease to, cease to give thanks to you, for you, remembering you in my prayers, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you the spirit of wisdom and of revelation and knowledge of him, having the eyes of your hearts enlightened, that you may know what is the hope to which he has called you, and the, what are the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints, and what is the immeasurable greatness of his power toward us who believe, according to the working of his great might, that he worked in Jesus Christ, when he raised him from the dead, and seated him at his right hand in heavenly places far above, and here we are getting to it, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion and above every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the one to come. And he put all things under his feet and gave him as head over all things to the church which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. Now, if you paid close attention to the passage I read a minute ago, our passage this morning, and then listen carefully to what I just read now, you probably notice that there are many correspondences between these passages. Not just the rules and powers and authorities and dominions, but many other correspondences, many other places where Paul is really talking about the same thing. And that is because Paul's mindset was always on the eschaton, always on the last days. His heart, his goal for all Christians in the churches that he established and the letters that he wrote is that we would live cognizant of the hope that we have in, in eternity and that it would have an impact and an effect in our lives now. And so when Jesus comes and all things are put under his feet, that all those rules, powers, authorities, and dominions will be under his feet as well. Now, these terms come up again in a passage with which we are very familiar in Ephesians 6, 10 through 12, where the Apostle Paul says, Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against rulers and against authorities, against cosmic powers over this present darkness, against spiritual forces of evil in heavenly places. And again, many of these same words are used, and very clearly these words are referring to Satan and his system, which has set itself up in opposition to God. And then one other cross-reference in, in Colossians. Chapter 2, verses 13 through 15, where we see Paul talking again, and he says, And you, who were dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made alive together with him, having forgiven us all our trespasses by canceling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands. This he set aside, nailing it to the cross. He disarmed the rulers and authorities and put them to open shame by triumphing over them in him. And so what is going on there is it is saying that God the Father put to shame, showed to have completely defeated these rulers and authorities by triumphing over them in Jesus Christ. And I think that that is probably a pretty clear reference to what Satan did in the Garden of Eden and how Jesus defeated the work that Satan did in bringing mankind to sin and how God the Father has undone, has disarmed the rulers and authorities by triumphing over them through the sacrifice that Jesus Christ made. And so when we see here in 1 Corinthians 15 um, this reference to uh, rule every authority and power, uh, I think it's 
very specifically a direct reference to Satan's system. I don't think that it means only Satan's system. I think it can also mean mankind's systems. I mentioned earlier when Adam fell, mankind lost some of the dominion that was given to him and that some of that dominion was given over to the prince of this world, Satan. Since that time, since the fall of man, both man and Satan have been setting up dominions of their own. Satan, for certain, is openly in direct competition with God. And there have been times when mankind has also built dominions which have been in direct competition with God. I think probably the most obvious example of this is the Tower of Babel. When God commanded those who came out of the ark after the flood to disperse and scatter over the whole earth and be fruitful and multiply while they were doing that. And they said, no, we are going to gather here and we are going to build a tower which reaches even into God's dominion. And so there have been times when man has directly opposed God's rule and God's command and has tried to set up competing rule and command. But most of men's efforts have not been like the Tower of Babel or Satan's completely opposite system to God. They have not been openly in competition with him. Still, they oppose his goals. And this is because most of man's systems, I might even dare to say all, are set up for their own glory if they are not set up according to the instructions of God's word. And even if they do not openly compete with God, they do attempt to take his glory from him. And this he will not tolerate because it is neither right to say, look at me, when we should be looking at God. And neither is it safe. For surely God has made us to be fulfilled in worship and recognition of his excellence. And if we turn that worship and that recognition in any other direction, it does damage to our souls. So these all must be brought to nothing. These all must be annihilated according to the passage. Then comes the end when he delivers the kingdom of God after destroying every rule, every authority and power. He must destroy, he must annihilate these things. When we are introduced to the lamb that was slain in Revelation chapter 5, we are told that only he is worthy to open the scroll which will reveal how it all turns out. That scroll with seven seals. John and Revelation and Paul in this morning's context are speaking of the same thing. When the lamb breaks the seals which reveal the trumpets and the bowls, he is doing just what Paul describes in this morning's passage. He is destroying every rule, every authority, and every power. And all all of these things are being brought to nothing so that at the end of the day all things are in submission to him and so we see that there must be a destruction of all of these systems who are the enemies that are being talked about here in this passage we see here that all of these things must be brought that he must reign verse 25 until he has put all his enemies under his feet even even the enemy of death clearly satan and his system are god's enemies jesus enemies we have also seen that death is an enemy so what makes something or someone an enemy according to the context of this passage what is it to be an enemy of god I think verse 25 starts off with an answer for us. And it starts off by saying, for he must reign. Enemies are anyone or anything which stands in the way of God's reign. And I would say probably also in the way of God's purpose through Jesus' current work to return creation to the way that things should be. At the very beginning, mankind represented only in Adam and Eve were in perfect communion with God. And they were put in charge of a relatively small part of the earth and said, this is yours. This is your garden. And in this garden, there is flora, there is fauna, and you're responsible for all of it. And you are to take what I have made in these last six days of creation. The chaos and, and the formlessness that we find on day one and the order and excellence and beauty that is there on day six. And you are to give it even more excellence and beauty as you see fit as my image bearers. 
This is the plan. This is the way things should be. And anyone who stands, anything that stands in the way of God's returning things to the way that they should be is an enemy. God's original dominion over creation through mankind will not be fully restored until the last enemy is defeated. And that enemy doesn't even have personality. That enemy is simply death. It is a consequence of man's disobedience. Death is separation in its simplest form. Separation from God is spiritual death. But in the meanwhile... We are called to engage in this war with Jesus. We are fighting on his side according to his commands as he is the head and we are the body. We already looked at the Ephesians 6 illustration of this war. We wrestle not against flesh and blood. Paul in 2 Corinthians chapter 10 uses another war-like illustration to give us some instructions, to give us some encouragement in how we are to approach this. Uh, 2 Corinthians 10, 3. For we walk, for though we walk in the flesh, we are not waging war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but have divine power to destroy strongholds. We destroy arguments and every lofty opinion raised against the knowledge of God and take every thought captive to obey Jesus Christ. And so we have a place in this war even now. And brothers and sisters, let me take a pause from the long sight, from looking far into the past and saying this is the way God meant it to be, and far into the future and say this is, this is way, the way it's going to return to be, and ask myself, ask all of us here, are we waging that war? Are you living in that war now? Or have you become comfortable? The context of that war is not some social justice sort of a thing. It's got very little to do with politics, although you should go to the polls and vote according to God's word in a couple of days here. It has more to do with the... <laughs> Excuse me. It has more to do with the inner man than anything else. You know that you are waging this war, not necessarily winning this war, but even just trying to fight it. If you can recognize that you are striving to bring every thought into captivity, every thought to the obedience of Jesus Christ, are you waging that war in the inner man in your life? Because if, if, if you are striving to bring every thought into captivity to Jesus Christ, then most everything else outside of you will be falling into line as well. Are you waging that war in your life today? Certain things must be destroyed. All these rules and powers and authorities, these enemies of God, and in fact the last enemy, death, will also be destroyed. According to Hebrews 2.14, Satan is the one who now wields the power of death. Still, there is a second death to which he is subject, and of which God only has control. Look in Luke chapter 12. Here Jesus is talking about death. Luke chapter 12, verses 4 through 7, Jesus says, I tell you, my friends, do not fear those who kill the body. After all, Satan had implements, he had tools that he was using. And he used those tools to persecute Jesus and eventually to kill him. Though God triumphed over them in it. And he, and he uses those tools throughout the book of Acts and down through the centuries to try to destroy the work of Jesus Christ. Do not fear those who have the power to kill the body, and after that they have nothing more that they can do. But I warn you whom to fear. Fear him who, after he is killed, has authority to cast into hell. Yes, I tell you, fear him. Are not five sparrows sold for two pennies, and not one of them is forgotten before God? Why, even the hairs of your head are numbered. Fear not, you are of more value than many sparrows. Do you see the threat and comfort? Two sides of the coin going on there with what Jesus is saying? There's a lot of... of 
opposition coming up in the apostles' lives. And we see that throughout the book of Acts, right? These guys, they, they fought against religious systems, Judaism, and the entrenched uh, self-righteousness and legalism of the Pharisees, the liberalism of the Sadducees, the secularism of the Hellenists. All of these things come together against Jesus and against his, against his apostles. And these systems opposed them and persecuted them and beat them and confiscated their property and put them into prison and led them to, the, to various types of execution. Jesus says, don't fear these. There is one even more to fear, and that is the one who has control over the second death, the ultimate expression of separation from life, from God himself. And yet after all of that, he says, God's got his eyes on you. Don't be afraid. Don't fear. God loves you far more than he loves the, all the other things that he notices. Don't fear. Don't fear death. For God has given you eternal life. Even this final enemy must be destroyed for God to return things to his perfect will. For things to get back to the way that they should have been before the fall. Now how does this take place? How can this even happen? I think it's a bit of a circle, but here's how Paul describes it in this passage. There is a subjection which occurs here. That's the most commonly used word that isn't an article in this passage. Subjection. Um, Paul quotes from both Psalm 8 and Psalm 110 in this passage. It's almost as though he's using Psalm 8 to interpret Psalm 110. He's, he's assisting himself with this. Do you see that here? Um, For he must reign, verse 25, until he has put all enemies under his feet. Um, things are put in subjection in verse 27. There's, there's a subjection that's going on here which occurs in both of these passages. Let's take a look at Psalm 8 just by way of review. We actually spent a lot of time in Psalm 8 last week. I want to read it again just to refresh our memories. Here David the psalmist says, O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You have set your glory above the heavens, out of the mouths of babies and infants. You have established strength because of your foes to still the enemy and the avenger. When I look at your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have set in place, what is man that you are mindful of him and the son of man that you care for him? Yet you have made him a little lower than the heavenly beings and have crowned him with glory and honor. You have given him dominion over the works of your hands. You have put all things under his feet, all sheep and oxen and beasts of the field, the birds of the heaven, the fish of the sea, whatever passes through the paths of the sea. O oh Lord, O oh Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. And of course, David is talking about the original created order and the intention that was there that has been marred, but that we will return to in the ultimate work of the serpent crusher. But when Paul quotes from Psalm 8, he takes this passage and he applies it not to the whole of mankind or even to the subset of mankind which is identified with Jesus Christ, with God through faith. Instead, he applies it directly to Jesus and he says, this is what Jesus has done. Jesus is the exemplar. He's the only man who came to earth and was born like the rest of us. He's the only man born who lived out sub dominion among mankind, dominion on this earth, and submission to the Father. All the rest of us, we go for our own glory. Jesus, when he came to earth and lived out his life, he lived it to do his Father's business and to glorify his Father. Jesus is the only one who succeeded in doing that. So that, that's what's going on in Psalm 8. Now let's look at Psalm 110, which is another messianic psalm that we are probably pretty familiar with. Psalm 110 says, The Lord says to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. The Lord sends forth from Zion your mighty scepter. Rule in the midst of your enemies. Your people will offer themselves freely on the day of your power in holy garments. From the womb of the morning, the dew of, the, of your youth will be yours. The Lord has sworn and will not change his mind. You are a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. The Lord is at your right hand. He will shatter kings on the day of his wrath. He will execute judgment among the nations, filling them with corpses. He will shatter chiefs over the wide earth. He will drink from the brook by the way. Therefore, he will lift up his head. 
And there's so much going on in this psalm. We've been dealing with quite a bit of it um, in our study in Hebrews that Eric has been teaching in Sunday school. And we're not going to go into the weeds here. Um, I just want to point out that both psalms say that God the Father puts everything under the Son's dominion. And Paul takes these passages and he interprets them in such a way that helps us understand God's work through the Son to bring about his will to fulfill that promise of the serpent crusher. Paul's interpretation is that the Son achieves this through his first and second coming, as well as in his rule to the end of the millennium. Once everything is thus ordered, once everything is brought in submission under the Son, through his rule, that he delivers all these things to the Father. Now, Paul has, in verse 27, just by way of side comment, um, kind of a parenthesis. I don't know if it's a parenthesis, really. But he says in verse 27, For God has put all things in subjection under his feet. But when it says all things are put in subjection, it is plain that he is accepted who put all things in subjection under him. So I think he just wants us to picture something. He wants us to picture God the Father and God the Son standing here side by side. And the plan is that God the Father takes all things and he puts it in subjection under the feet of the Son. So the Son is standing here on the top of the platform and everything is under him. And God the Father is standing next to the Son and everything is under the Son that the Father has put there. But the Father didn't put himself there. That's what Paul's saying. All right? So the Father is not in subjection to the Son. Instead, the Father puts everything in subjection under the Son and the Son, having everything in subjection under himself, puts himself in subjection under the Father. That's the, the sequence of this submission that's occurring. And in verse 27, Paul's just wanting to be very clear about that. He's wanting us to understand that the Father and the Son, they aren't the same person. They're, they're separate people. And he wants us to understand that the Father is not in subjection to the Son. He actually very clearly says the Son puts himself in subjection to the Father. It's a matter of will, a desire in the Son that he would do that. That's the message there of verse 27. So here's the circle. The Father has promised to put all things under the Son's feet. The Son himself achieves this according to the Father's will and is himself in subjection to the Father so that whatever is under his feet, that is everything, is also in subjection to the Father because he is in subjection to the Father. It's like what happens sometimes in um, this political season, or at least it's close. <laughs> and that is that you have a you have two people in competition uh, actually usually it's three you've got three people in competition for votes you've got a republican a democrat and an independent and an independent is very often representing um, a, a, an anti-federalist sort of a position. And so a lot of his positions come in line with conservatives. And he is taking votes away from the Republicans. And sometimes an independent will say, well, I've only got 1% of the polls. I know that if I stay, I'm not even going to come close to winning. And so I'm going to step out of the race, and I'm going to endorse the person whose position is closest to mine, and that is this person's. This person's position is the one that's close to mine. Um, he, is t and he is signaling to everyone who would have voted for him, I want you to vote for this guy, because I am. I'm stepping out of the race so I can give my vote to him, and I want all of my supporters also to vote for him. That is a little bit of an example. Now, these aren't votes in eternity, and these aren't options. God must reign. Jesus must reign, it says here. And all of this is so that God may be all in all. Today we live out this all in all thing through being under the Son's authority. We ought to do all things for his sake and for his glory, even as he did all things for the Father's sake and for the Father's glory. And if you want to think about this and develop this a little further, because we're, we're nearly out of time this morning, I would say that Jesus works this idea out very clearly in his high priestly prayer in John chapter 17. 
So there is an order to this subjection. There is a certain way that it's going to happen. But then comes the end, which is actually how our passage starts this morning. And we're going to end at the beginning of this passage. As I described earlier, all competing authorities must be brought into subjection under the sun. And he must reign until all enemies are put under his feet. This implies that there is a progression which occurs, that there is a process. Now this process, I think, began when Jesus died on the cross and came back from the dead and then made the church his means whereby he advertises himself to the world. But the next big step, the next big turn that God's will takes is the great tribulation. Jesus Christ will come halfway back. There will be a rapture of his church. All people who have accepted Jesus Christ as their Savior, then living on the earth, will be, will be taken up to heaven. There will also be a resurrection which occurs at that same time. Of all believers, perhaps through all time, perhaps not through all time, perhaps all believers in the church. And we will be caught up together with him in the clouds and meet the Lord in the air, and so we shall be forever with the Lord. When that occurs, the great tribulation, more or less at that time, begins. At the end of the great tribulation, Satan is thrown into the abyss for a thousand years, and Jesus reigns. We have this description in Matthew 24 and 25 in Revelation chapter 20. Though that reign is described as excellent, in those passages and in other places, we see that people will still die during the millennium. One of the only ways a person will die during the millennium is by rebelling against God. Because we are told that Jesus will rule with a rod of iron. And those who rise in rebellion against God during the millennium, their rebellion will be met with swift and just retribution. But what this means is that even during that 1,000 year reign, the final enemy, that is death, is not yet defeated. And we're told here that he must reign until all his enemies are put under his feet. Right? So, so long as death is not defeated, so long as death is not abolished, the serpent crusher's work isn't done. Things haven't been returned to the way that they were before the fall of mankind. And so even during the millennium, even during this excellent time, the ultimate fulfillment of the promise of the serpent crusher is not yet complete. At the end of the 1,000 years, there is another battle when all dominions are fully defeated and consigned to the lake of fire, the second death. The death itself is defeated, and we see that accounted for in the shining final two chapters of the Bible, Revelation 21 and 22. There are a couple of statements in this passage that we've spent some time in this morning which are especially glorious for those of us who believe. The first is the last enemy to be destroyed is death. You see, death no longer has dominion over us. Paul returns to this hope later in this passage at the end of 1 Corinthians 15. We actually read that paragraph last week and we'll spend time in it um, sometime over the next couple of months. <coughs> The second phrase, which ought to put us in a position of celebration, is the phrase, he must reign. That word, or that phrase, he must, is constructed in such a way that one could also translate it, it is necessary that he reign. That 